Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry we can't be there in person, um, but this is the new way of providing information to communities and consultations within the communities. Um, it just helps everybody to be a little bit more safe to do things virtually for now. Um, so my name is Coram Lightning Earl. I am a lawyer with Wakoto and Law and Governance Lodge at the University of Alberta. And I also have my own private firm, which is called Thunderbird Law. And I mostly do governance work for communities. Uh, I've been a lawyer for over 10 years and I've been, my nation is, I'm from Samson Cree Nation. Uh, and so I've been working in Treaty 6 area for a while now. And I'm just thankful to be here. And today we're gonna talk to you about Bill C-92 and go through uh, the legislation for you. And then we'll have questions at the end. And I'm, I'm Hadley Friedland. I'm a co-lead with the Wakotawin Law and Governance Lodge. So Corn and I work together. Um, and I'm also a law professor at the University of Alberta Faculty of Law. And I'm uh, zooming in from Assiniwichi Winnewick Nation Territory. So we're going to talk about um, today, we want to talk about the new federal act and we're calling it Bill C-92 because the name is long, um, but, it, but it is a law now, not just a bill. Uh, an act respecting First Nations, Inuit and Métis children, youth and families. This is the first federal legislation on the subject of Indigenous child and family services in Canada. Um, so there's some historic firsts here. This is the first statute to recognize and affirm inherent Indigenous jurisdiction or authority over child and family services as an Aboriginal or treaty right, so that's section 35 of the Constitution right in Canada. This statute also establishes national minimum st standards for child and family services delivery um, to all Indigenous children and families across Canada. It applies to First Nation, non-status, Métis and Inuit children. It applies to children and families living on or off reserve. And this act came into force or became law on January 1st, 2020. Um, so that means the national standards applies in all provinces as of that date. Um, within a year, um, many Indigenous groups across Canada are working on developing their own laws or legislation and where that's different, and we'll talk about that a little later on, um, it will prevail or be more powerful than the provincial um, child and family services legislation. So that's a huge change in opportunity. Um, Quebec uh, provinces have had different reactions to this law. Quebec is challenging it in court right now. Um, that's not going to be heard until, it's not even going to be heard until September 2021. Um, it's a reference case at the Court of Appeal, um, but this law still applies in Quebec, in Alberta, um, everywhere. Uh, that doesn't affect this law applying. With this law came a lot of change and uncertainty, and a lot of people were very weary about the legislation because it came out very fast. It was There was a lot of commotion about the law, um, and then it came out on June 21st last year. Uh, and then it came into effect this past January. And so it was a response to the TRC calls to action, a lot of Indigenous and advocacy and advocacy around Indigenous child welfare. There's a First Nations Caring Society case, which talks about the inequity in the child welfare system regarding Indigenous children. There was a case called Brown in Canada. Um, and then there's also looking at other systems like the United States, they have NICWA, which monitors their National Indian Child Welfare Law. Um, so we've been looking a lot at that research also. And then there's also other research regarding attachment and culture and how that uh, has an effect on the child's upbringing. Normally when legislation comes out from the federal government, it comes out with some sort of regulations like policies or guides, something for um, communities to use, something for uh, judges and lawyers to use so people know how to interpret the law um, but unfortunately with this legislation they none of that came out um, the provinces and the feds did have their own little powerpoints but there was nobody interpreting the legislation for people so that's kind of the work that we're doing is we've just trying to interpret it and bring it out to communities to let them know how this law does can can affect them and how they can use it to their advantage um, so there's 
a lots of possibilities. So we will have a, there's your regular provincial child welfare law that each of the provinces have. There will be this federal legislation that will apply. And then also if indigenous communities take uh, control and they decide to have their own child welfare law, so we could have potentially 400 or more different child welfare laws in Canada. Um, and it would, but it all depends on moving forward. And currently there's no list of who has these laws. Um, so that's something that moving forward, there'll be, there's a possibility for a lot of different interpretation um, regarding child welfare and Indigenous children. And there wasn't any commitment or clarity regarding funding. And we'll talk a little bit more when we get to that slide. So there was no like guaranteed you will get X dollar for X child in care or X dollar for this. There was only really one paragraph regarding funding in the legislation. So there's two main parts of this law and the part that has gotten the most sort of media attention and attention is the inherent jurisdiction in that lawmaking and we are going to talk about this but we want to also talk about the other part of this law that's that's law right now um, and should be being applied which is the national standards and we see a lot of potential in the national standards first of all um, to make a difference um, in children's and families lives and second of all um, for uh, communities to be self-determining, um, to be making um, small steps and taking action right now, um, not necessarily um, being able to do things that don't necessarily mean doing a, a full law or full jurisdiction, but just taking action um, within these national standards, and we'll point those out when we see them. So these national standards are in force right now. They apply to both federal and provincial governments. And what they do is set out a number of minimum standards related to child and family services delivery. Um, so uh, what that means is it doesn't displace the provincial act. That law is still in place. Um, but where this act, uh, there might be a conflict or the provincial law is inconsistent, what is said in this law applies in the province. So the best way to do this, this can seem um, confusing. So do you need two sets of laws in front of you to understand what children and families are entitled to? And I think the simpler way um, to do that is to start with these national standards. Um, think of these national standards as a door. And then if the province wants to come back and argue that things are inconsistent, then, um, or, or that they are already doing that with their laws, um, they, can, they can do that, but, but this, um, the national standards are the starting point now. And when, uh, when uh, nations um, are making their own child and family services law, it's not going to replace these standards, um, although the laws may influence the interpretation of best interests of the child, and we'll spend a little more time on best interests of the child later on. So there's several principles when interpreting and applying the act. Uh, and so best interest of the child is something that will always be kind of like that conscience on your shoulder, let it be your guide when working with the children. But the difference here, it's best interest of the indigenous child. Uh, so it's not best interest of a child that lives in West Edmonton, but it's best interest of an indigenous child. And that's understanding that there are some unique factors with Indigenous children in regards to their cultural and who they are as Indigenous people. And so that's something I think that is very key in this document. It also talks about cultural continuity and that it's essential for the well-being of children that they have that cultural continuity. Um, so ha they have to understand their culture, they have to know it, there has to be some continuity in their care and so that's the next point, which is child and family services must not contribute to assimilation or cultural destruction. And why we put, why that was put into the legislation is just to remind people of the seriousness of this legislation and a reminder that we do have a high number of Indigenous children in care. And some of them, um, many of them are there for various reasons and some of them can be because of these reasons and to acknowledge what was done in the past with residential schools. Also substantive equality. The child, the child's family, and the child's governing body must all be able to exercise their rights under this act. And so the difference for this now 
too is that with Indigenous children, it's not just First Nation, but this also includes Métis and Inuit children being able to exercise those rights and their governing bodies being able to exercise those rights that they didn't have before January 2020. And so that's something that's really important. And then also a jurisdictional dispute cannot result in a gap of services. So if they're fighting over who has jurisdiction of a child, that can, can they can have that conversation, but it must not result in a gap of services. The child's needs must be met immediately at the onset. And maybe I'll just jump in there that that, that jurisdictional gap, that's basically Jordan's principle. If you're familiar with Jordan's principle, this is, this is putting this into law. So if we'll, we'll focus on best interests of the child um, and best interests of the Indigenous child, because this really is a central legal principle um, that every single piece of legislation, family law or um, child welfare law across Canada and most of the world um, ends up focusing on and turning on. Um, so, so this is quite important and often best interests of the child has been used as, as, as Corin alluded to in ways that, that don't lead to good results for Indigenous children um, in the long term or sometimes even the short term. Um, and there's been recognition of that and a lot of research done on that um, and, and Indigenous advocacy for, for decades um, pointing this out. So one thing in these national standards is, is setting out that the best interests of the Indigenous child requires a new analysis. Um, judges and decision makers can't keep doing the same old, same old here. One of the things that often happens with best interests of the child is there's a list of factors. And the judge will say, well, none of them are super weighted. Um, so therefore, I will basically do what I want to do. I'll pick the factor and say that this is in the best interest of the child. Well, this legislation does give a super weight to some factors. And the factors are the importance of the child's family relationships and community connections. So there's a primary consideration clause that sets out saying when considering the best interest factors, primary consideration must be given to the child's physical, emotional, and psychological safety, security, and well-being. And keep in mind that that well-being we already have, that cultural continuity is key to that well-being. Then it goes on to say, as well as to the importance for that child of having an ongoing relationship with their family and with the Indigenous group, community, or people to which they belong, and of preserving the child's connections to their culture. So that's a super weight of those relationships and community and cultural connections. So there's eight factors regarding best interests of the Indigenous child. So the first one is, again, their, their cultural, linguistic, religious, and spiritual upbringing and their heritage, their age and stage of development, the nature and strength of the relationship with their parents, care provider, any member of the, his or her family. And so this part takes into account the, the definition of Indigenous families. Like, it's not just the nuclear family, mother and father. It now takes into account all members of their family into account when they're having those relationships, understanding that there are people in Indigenous children's lives that also have important meaning in their family, such as aunties or uncles or grandparents, and whatever those may be. So this uh, brings that into focus. And also, the, one of the key things and new things within this legislation is the importance of the child's ongoing relationship with his or her Indigenous family, community, language, and territory. So that means they have to have an ongoing relationship. So that means they had to have, have some sort of relationship with their family, their community, language, and territory. So we shouldn't have children in care that don't know who their family is, that don't know who their community is, that don't know what language that their community speaks, and they don't know where their territory is. That's something that won't be happening should not be happening anymore. And so children will have to be building relationships with all of these factors. And so when we meet with non-Indigenous social workers, we let them know like, it's all four, it's not one or the other. So territory, so you would have to show them to their territory. It's not just enough to say their culture role component for this year was they went to a powwow. Now it's just gives that must, 
more emphasis on what culture is and how broad it is and how it's not just checking the box is not enough. It has to be more and fluid and real. So the other factors um, are also important. Um, some of them are important, and again, you'll see them, they're, they're the exact same wording as the new Divorce Act that's coming out. Um, they're repeated in a lot of legislation, and then we'll focus on the one that is, is unique to this uh, act. So the child views and preferences, um, of course, very important. Um, paying attention to any family violence and the impact on the child. And, and paying attention to any other um, court proceedings or, or criminal proceedings, et cetera, um, that might be relevant. Um, the other piece here says any plans for the child's care, including care in accordance with the customs and traditions of the Indigenous group. So we're flagging this because this is a, a, um, something that's unique to this act. And it's also something where, again, this means that you don't have to wait until you have a complete act drafted before you start um, applying um, your own jurisdiction. Um, so the community can say, well, yes, we do make plans for a child's care and this is the way we do it. So this is with, according to our customs and traditions, um, what's required to make this plan of care or to sit down, family and community can sit down and say, okay, here is the plan of care. So. We, you know, we don't have to wait till we have a complete uh, act drafted. We can address this right now for this individual child that there are ways to create a plan of care from within the community and, and bringing that forward under this provision. One of the things that they really wanted to hit home is to, when people are looking at the intent of what they're doing, but also to look at the effect of what they're doing, not just what their intentions are, but what effect there, this is going to have with the children in care. So they have to take into account the child's needs, their culture, allow children to know their family origins, and again, provide substantive quality between the children and other children. And that's where the Jordan principle comes in. But again, it's, in, in, it's encouraging and informing child family services to look at the effect of what they're doing and what it has on those children because we can see the long-term effects of children in care and a lot of research has said that these factors do have an effect on children if they are not taken care of. The next part of the national standards um, has three sections. So one is looking at preventative provisions, um, looking at what happens um, if a child is going into care, looking at placement and notice, and then looking at after placement where that happens in a child's life. So the first set of standards is around preventative provisions and it says when consistent with the best interests of the child. Now almost every provision and we'll highlight the one that doesn't have this will say something like when consistent with the best interests of the child if not counter to the best interests of the child. So we won't repeat that every time we'll just say that these are like Corin said that conscious on your shoulder best interests of the child applies every time. But it's this definition of best interests of the Indigenous child. It's this analysis, not, um, not, not some random decision maker who's not considering it this way. So this stresses the priority of preventative care and prenatal care. Um, so when child and family services is being delivered, uh, there's a need to give priority to preventative care measures over other services. So in-home family support, counseling, support within the home, um, rather than apprehension. There's also a clause talking about the need to give priority to prenatal care um, when likely to be in the best interest of the child after birth. And this is really important. Um, and we've done some work with uh, a doctor from the Indigenous Wellness Clinic at the Royal Alec to talk about what this might look like, um, what can health professionals um, and child and family services worker um, consider when thinking about giving priority to prenatal care. So this might include preventative prenatal services, um, essential services and specialized. So this could be as simple as food. We know that, um, uh, when, when a parent is pregnant, um, eating is going to be in the best interest of the child. And if, if there's struggle for basic needs, supplying those basic needs are going to benefit 
um, the child after birth. It could be specialized, it could be addiction treatment, it could be um, support for certain things that that parent is struggling with. Um, it could be specialized medical, medical needs. Um, this also provides um, possibility for preventative services planning for after birth. So if there's a situation where it seems likely that a parent may struggle after birth, um, rather than waiting um, kind of a wait and see approach, there can be planning to set up preventative services ahead of time. So um, when this parent comes home with the child, there are already things in place set up to, to support this um, as best as possible. And in those certain situations, um, there can be situations where the parent um, themselves know that they are not going to be able to care safely for this child after birth. This could also be placement planning. Um, so the parent is in control or the family is in control of saying, this is what's going to happen. Here's who's going to care for this child after birth. And that can be set up um, prior to birth rather than um, a traumatic and uh, difficult moment after birth, which we know doesn't, doesn't serve anyone. So one of the other um, components is these preventative provisions is two key things. Again, it has to be with when it's consistent with the best interest of the child, uh, must look at socioeconomic conditions. They cannot be apprehended based on their economic conditions, which include poverty, lack of housing or infrastructure, or the health of their parents or care provider, um, unless it's not in their best interest. But again, as long as it coincides with that, and you also must look at reasonable efforts before apprehending. So if someone resides with their parent or family member, the service provider must demonstrate he or she has made reasonable efforts to have the child continue to reside with that person. And in law, they like to use a lot of words such as may or must, and may is kind of like that word when you're talking to your children, well, maybe, like there's always that possibility, but it's not set in stone. Um, whereas if you say must, then you know it is a done deal. So must is very, it's, it has to happen. And in law, when they use the word must, it means it's definitive, this has to happen um, or cannot happen. And so in here, it's things that we wouldn't think about, but it's really requiring people to look outside of that box. Um, for, for the children that they're looking at. We've met with some agencies where they're like, of course we wouldn't apprehend. If we walked into a home and it was because they needed groceries, we would buy them groceries. Or if the parents were sick, like what if both parents were sick right now with COVID, would they get apprehended? No, but it could be a reason for a service provider to say, well, they can't physically take care of them. Well, then provide some wraparound services for that family. Well, maybe grandma couldn't take care of them because they didn't have adequate beds. This an, an organization I know of would just say, okay, well, we bought them beds, or we built them a room, or we bought them some clothes, or we bought them a tutor. And they would do all reasonable efforts to ensure that that child would stay in that home as long as it was in their best interest. And so not a lot of agencies think like that. It's, it's people think linear, this and this and this. And so sometimes thinking out of the box is difficult. So this is where we encourage people that have great programs and are doing great things to really um, display those so that other people can see what is possible because sometimes we can't imagine what is possible unless we hear about it happening. So what we're going to be doing at the Wakodwan Lodge is we're going to be gathering, trying to gather information so that when it comes to those times you can say oh here's an idea, here's something we can do or if you're dealing with an agency that isn't maybe going through these things you can offer some suggestions. And so again, they must demonstrate. So that means if they're in court and they're asking for an apprehension order, as a judge or a lawyer on the other side, I would be asking for them to demonstrate how they made any effort to have these ch this child reside with their parents. And then they would have to document that for me. And if they didn't make any efforts, then they didn't satisfy this section of the, the law. So again, it's looking at those from both sides. How are we doing those? But how can we ensure other people are following through on these obligations? The next part of these provisions talk about notice and representation. So this isn't a huge change for First Nations in Alberta, um, but it is a, a change across um, Canada and it's a change for um, communities that may be Métis or Inuit, etc. Um, so the Métis settlements in Alberta here, let's say. Um, so there are notice and representation requirements 
in this act. First, um, the service provider must give notice to the child's parents and the care provider, and we'll talk about that term in a minute, as well as the Indigenous governing body before any significant measure in relation to the child. So the key here, and we'll define all of these terms, but the key here is before any significant measure, um, not playing catch up, not saying, hey, by the way, this happened um, two weeks ago. Uh, can you weigh in now? Um, it needs to happen before that. And the same parties have the right to make representations in court um, or any other civil proceeding. The parents and care providers have party status. Um, the Indigenous governing body, the First Nation um, or other government has, uh, has the right to make representations but doesn't have that party status that the parents or care providers still have a little bit more in that respect. A word that we've been tossing around is this Indigenous governing bodies. And to most people, it's straight up. It's We understand that it would be a band council or a governing organization like Métis Nation or National uh, Inuit organization. It could be other tribal organizations that are granted authority to make decision over multiple band councils, like a tribal office. Um, for example, the Anishinaabe, they have one organization that manages the child welfare for up to 22 of their smaller bands. So they would be the Indigenous governing body in that case. Um, so yeah, it's, that's basically what it is. Um, but on the other side, for non-Indigenous people, this is a definition that is new to them um, because they're used to seeing things like band council. But the reason it says Indigenous governing bodies is just to include that this legislation does include Métis, non-status, and Inuit children. So there may be a variety of organizations that govern and support those children. And so that just recognizes those new inclusions into the legislation. Another word that's defined in the act is uh, care providers. So this is defined as saying a person who has primary responsibility for, for providing the day-to-day -day care of an Indigenous child other than the child's parents. And again, this says it can include in accordance with the custom or traditions of the Indigenous group, community, or people to which the child belongs. Um, so this is, again, just recognizing that the definitions of families can be um, different and expanded within Indigenous communities than necessarily how maybe non-Indigenous CFS workers understand family. So it can include family members, grandparents, aunts, uncles. Um, it could include a situation where um, it, it, the, the living arrangement fits in, in a customary adoption setting. What it doesn't include, and actually um, kudos to the Alberta government um, for making it clear that they also see this, um, it's not going to include unrelated non-Indigenous foster parents. So this was brought up um, when this was going through Parliament. Uh, there was a fear that using care providers um, would lead to uh, allowing um, non-Indigenous foster parents or group care providers um, to be able to have that party status and that wouldn't make sense when you look at the whole scheme of the act and and yeah I, we're glad to see that the Alberta government agrees with that and says that this would not include those people. Within the legislation it does talk about significant measures uh, and for significant measures it says like if there's any significant measures then the child's family and Indigenous governing body must be made aware of, and but it's not defined in the legislation. Um, and we haven't seen anybody else define it, so we've taken it upon ourselves to define it for everybody, and we encourage people to use our definition. In keeping in mind with the legislation um, and the way that the legislation is meant to be broad and inclusive, that's how we've created our definition. So it's not just legal changes, so not when they become temporary, permanent, private, not just legal changes that also need to be notified, but other things, changes in their placement. Are they moving from a foster placement to a group home placement or to a more institutionalized placement? Uh, service provider awareness, are they changing service providers? Um, responses to issues such as suicide ideation or behavior, sexual identity, are they coming of age? Anything that could significantly change the day-to-day -day life of the child the parent or the care provider, or can impact the likelihood or timeline of apprehension, permanency, and reunification. So when we think about it as a whole, any change is a new opportunity to reunify, or are these changes having an effect on the opportunity to reunify? But we can't, we won't know unless we're made aware of those changes. 
There might be programs or support systems in the community to support some of these issues, but we won't know unless this, the Child and Family Services informs us of those. So it's really a way to support the child and ensure that the needs of the Indigenous child are being met. So where a child is placed, um, one of the strong things about this act, and this um, is, is almost identical to a similar provision um, in ICWA in the States, um, and lawyers in the States will say that this particular provision is, is one that can actually be acted on and enforced in, in one of the, the most significant ways. So this act talks about placement priorities. This is also important in a place like Alberta, where courts have, have in the past said, oh, we won't get involved in actual placement. Um, that's up to the director. That's up to CFS. So this changes that. Um, it changes the law in Alberta to say, no, this is now the business of the courts and there needs to be oversight in how placement is occurring. So this sets out again the is. So there's a must, right, rather than a may. Um, Placement is to occur in order of priority. First, the child's parents. Second, child's family members. Um, third, uh, another member of the child's Indigenous community. Um, fourth, another Indigenous placement. And finally, other. Um, so, so that would be out of care, out of home care or non-Indigenous placements. Um, it also says you must consider a possibility of placement with or near siblings. And they brought in that definition of siblings again, because uh, some people who are siblings within Indigenous communities, we know non-Indigenous people might say, oh, those are cousins. So it broadens that and recognizes that there's a, di a different definition there and says it goes beyond biological, same biological mother and father. And it also says, um, again, must take into account customs and traditions such as custom adoptions. Um, so again, a real chance here for communities um, to uh, practice that self-determination and, and, and say, here's what our customs and traditions are and here's why in this particular case, this was a custom adoption um, or, or this relationship is something that's really important um, for the decision maker to keep in mind. With this section also, we, we talked before about people having to make reasonable efforts for placement. So that goes along with this. They have to show that how they made reasonable efforts with the first, with the parents, the family member, the community member, and other Indigenous. If child A ends up in a non-Indigenous foster home, well, I want to see the reasons and the document and evidence of why the first, second, third, and fourth placement didn't work out. We can't just jump straight to non-Indigenous foster placement anymore. There is that placement of priority. So it's another thing to use as a tool in your communities. So this really means kinship and getting people to understand that there is support needed for these children, but also to put other people on notice that there is a process that they have to go through. So that means um, people are going to have to go into communities. They're going to have to build relationships um, with communities. Um, they won't be able to just send it to the Dele to the delegated worker, they'll have to go in themselves and build these relationships. Because how else can they learn about their family members, or their community members, if they're not in the community themselves investigating those connections? Also, there's this protection and uh, out of home care provisions. So there's this new thing, which is ongoing reassessment for family unity. As there must be a reassess reassessment conducted on an ongoing, place, ongoing basis to see if it's appropriate to place the child with the parents or other family members. And so this is important because it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be any more private or permanent, but it means there has to be that ongoing reassessment. So it could be, there's, it's no longer, okay, child's done, we don't have, we, there's no way for us to get our child back because of that you could put it in court orders, must be reassessed every six months or every year, whatever the period is, it can be put right into the court order now. And anybody can ask for a reassessment. The child themselves can ask for a reassessment, the family, the community. So this is in going to be interesting to see how this plays out over the years, um, because a lot of people are looking at this as a tool for some of those children that maybe communities haven't seen in a very long time. The other thing is the attachment and emotional ties. 
So if a child's not placed with their parents or family members, how are those attachment and emotional ties being promoted? They must be promoted, so how are they doing that? And we think of now in the age of COVID, well, how can that happen? Well, there's social visits, outdoor social distancing, there's FaceTime, there's all sorts of things. I play, I play Scrabble with my niece on a daily basis and we chat about all these words. That's just the really, it's a connection that we have. But just thinking outside the box of how can we support these ties, even in times such as now, just because we're in a pandemic, doesn't mean that this is ruled out. Everything is as is, at least it is, it is on the, the, the family app side. They're not allowing parents to use COVID as a reason not to see the other parent. So that should be held the same in child welfare. So the other part of this act is the inherent jurisdiction part of the act, and this is the lawmaking. And, and I mean, this is, this is a huge endeavor, um, but it's, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because the act is actually pretty um, simple. Uh, the work is not necessarily that simple. Um, but this is, this is a huge historic part of this act, and um, it shouldn't be underestimated. It, so again, it recognizes and affirms as a Section 35 right the inherent right of self-government and that this inherent right of self-government includes jurisdiction in relation to child and family services. This is so huge because really there, there's so much harm um, that has been done by non-Indigenous governments to Indigenous children and families um, for decades, for, for centuries here in Canada. And if you really get to the root of that, um, what's the cause of all of this? the cause is really not recognizing this inherent jurisdiction, um, not affirming and respecting the fact that Indigenous peoples uh, have the authority to make decisions about Indigenous children and families like every other society. So in recognizing this as an Aboriginal or treaty right, they say it includes, um, but of course it's not limited to, authority for Indigenous governing bodies to draft their own child welfare laws, um, to make those laws, to administer and enforce those child and family services laws, and to provide dispute resolution mechanisms. So this might look like something like the tribal courts in the states, this might look like a circle, this might look like a grandmother's council, um, some sort of dispute resolution to decide what happens um, when there's a dispute about how these laws should be applied in a particular case. So if an Indigenous community created their own law, they would have the power, this law would have the same force as any federal law after a year. They'd have to go through a process, which I'll talk about in a, in a bit, and then they would prevail over other federal laws. There are some exceptions, such as the Canadian Human Rights Act and the Charter, it still has to keep in mind those um, principles that we talked about and it would prevail over provincial laws. So the province, if they encountered a child, say from Enoch and Enoch had its own law, they would have to follow the Enoch child welfare law, not the Alberta child welfare law. So that's something that's very unique and it's an opportunity for organizations to look at that and say, this is maybe something we want to do for our community. And there's lots of options, which I'll talk about in a minute. And of course, um, when, when the government recognizes a right, they're going to jump in here and also say, um, but luckily courts have told us we can regulate and even justifiably infringe these rights. Um, so this bill does, or, or this law, um, regulates inherent jurisdiction um, with a few limits. Um, one is, as Corin said, uh, Indigenous Child and Family Services Law will be subject to the application of the Charter and the Canadian Human Rights Act. There's a stronger ties provision um, talking about where a child belongs to two Indigenous groups. Um, the laws of the group who has the strongest ties uh, will apply. Now there's some Indigenous groups in BC that are starting to work on bilateral or trilateral agreements between them. Um, so they can work things out based on their own laws and based on their own relationships um, to identify how how laws will apply where there's a child that belongs to two Indigenous groups. Um, so that's also another option to address this. Um, and of course it says um, Indigenous child and family services laws will not be applied if they are deemed contrary to the best interests of the child. 
this is a bit of a, a wasted provision. Um, actually, no laws um, in Canada can be applied if they're contrary, if, if a court deems them contrary to the best interests of the child. So it's, it's not necessary in this act, but there it is. Um, and I guess, again, just a reminder that it has to be this new analysis. It has to be the best interests of the Indigenous child according to this act. So if an organization wanted to create a law, um, they would go through a several processes. They would give notice to prevent the province and the feds that they're going to use this, intend to exercise their lawmaking authority. They would send them a memo, say, hey, we're going to create our own law. Then they would have about a year to enter into these coordination agreements with the province or the federal government. And these coordination agreements would talk about things like emergency services, support measures, any fiscal arrangements. And it's, it, there's no template for these agreements yet. Nobody's come out with one, we haven't seen any yet. Um, but if we, a shot in the dark would be something like the MOU that we signed with, that DFNA signed with the province. Maybe it would look something like that. Um, but again, it would be something that they would have to do and you have to, have a year to make reasonable efforts to try and make build those relationships with the province and the feds and try making that agreement and then after a year you have your law um, if you have one of these coordination agreements great then your law would go through there is the possibility that the maybe the province doesn't come to the table or maybe even the feds don't come to the table um, but and they say and you tried to get a hold of them and we couldn't we made reasonable efforts so you send them a fax we send them registered mail we sent carrier pigeons whatever it may be if you can show that you've made reasonable efforts you could go forward and have a law and have had no input or consultation from the province that you resided um, which may be the case in some provinces and again you have to publish it and there'll be a website which will have these notices these coordination agreements and CFS laws. I would have them all on this fancy website. It's not up yet, but I assume it will be coming as more people move forward with this. Now, if you wanted to create your law, it doesn't need to be an all or nothing law. Like if Enoch decided that maybe we just want to overtake over um, active efforts and we just want to deal with supports and families and kinship. We don't want to deal with the Kate. We don't have the capacity yet to to manage a caseload. So we're just gonna do step A. So you could create a law around step A and then say, okay, and just have a plan that says in three years, we'll take over full authority, but right now we only want X, X, and then later we'll do Y and Z. So it's not an all or nothing thing. It depends on what works for your community. That's the beauty of this, it's what works for you. And you can, there's lots of different avenues. You can put out statements, these are how, all of those principles are going to be involved. We want every child on Enoch to be visiting, to come to this ceremony, to have their career name, to have, you can be setting up opportunities for play field relationships, looking at all those kinship opportunities. So really it, we're only limited by what our mind limits us to and what we want to do to provide services for our children. So we talked about funding before. Um, this is a, a, a big issue in this act. Um, one of the senators um, said to us that every single expert that testified when this was going through parliament uh, said address funding in this act, don't leave it. Um, but the only uh, clause that addresses funding is this one. Um, and what you can see here is this is a may clause, not a must clause. Um, and that's our concern. The wording is great. Um, we just want that to say must instead of may, um, but they say may enter into a coordination agreement, which may include fiscal arrangements relating to the provision of child and family services that are sustainable, needs-based, and consistent with the principle of substantive equality um, in order to secure long-term positive outcomes and support the capacity of the Indigenous group. So this sounds great. Um, our concern is in May. And we've recently heard, and you may have seen on the news um, or heard through other means, um, that AFN and the federal government are working on an MOU to address funding um, for this act. So that's sort of a wait and see. And hopefully that is something um, that is positive and productive. So when we think about this legislation, um, and we, in the beginning, I was not its biggest fan. I was like, this is not very good. 
Um, but then it's like, well, it's here. How can we really look at this legislation and make it work for us? It's there. How can we use it to the best of our to best of our advantage? Which is the whole reason why I went to law school. It's not to learn the law, but how to learn the law to make it work for my communities. Um, and so that's when I look at this legislation is when we're working with communities, take what we need and how can we build organizations and programs for the best interests of our children in child welfare. Um, especially because it's a big passion of mine. It's something that I've been involved in for a long time. So yeah, so we hope that we be able to bring some clarity. I know it's a lot of information <laughs> um, and we have a lot of supporting documents on our website. Um, if you go to our website, there's lots of information on there. We're coming out with a parent's guide, also a, ch a children's guide to Bill C-92. So as we have more time, we create more documents just to create information for people and because we really believe in access to information.